Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, this is Chris Chinock here. Uh, welcome to the uh, the webinar. This is sponsored by uh, by Copen, and today we're going to talk about um, Copen's plans to develop um, micro OLEDs uh, to reach hopefully 30,000 nits uh, in the near term. Um, and so um, we're going to start off the uh, uh, the webinar with um, uh, his introduction. Let me see, let me take advance the slide here. There we go, that's full screen now, I hope. Uh, so yeah, uh, um, Hang, Hang Choi is on the uh, on the call. He's gonna do a, an introduction to um, his technology, the Copen technology and the roadmap to reach uh, 30,000 nits. Uh, that will go for 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, we'll then uh, uh, bring in two additional speakers uh, to join in a panel discussion. Uh, we'll do that for 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, and uh, then we'll open up to the audience for Q&A. Uh, and if you want to start um, entering some questions along the way, please use, there's a, a question tab that should be on your, your interface. Uh, so please use that to, to uh, enter your questions. Uh, I will uh, review those and then re-ask them to the panelists um, as we're moving along. Uh, also, during that audience Q&A session, I've uh, set up three audience polls um, that will I'll flash up on the screen from time to time, and you can uh, voice your opinions on, on those questions. So without ado, uh, I will turn this over to Hong Choi, who is the CTO of Copen. Hong, huh? the floor is for the introduction and hello everyone. Uh, today's topic is whether color OLED micro display can achieve very high brightness like 30,000 nits. Although monochrome green OLED displays have achieved 30,000 nits or more, it has been very challenging for color OLED displays to achieve such high brightness. And frankly, we thought it was not possible only a few months ago. Um, we changed our thought because of our recent breakthrough research. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a sec. There we go. Okay. So uh, probably some of you already know that we achieved uh, 7,000 nits color OLEDs uh, from our 720p OLED micro display on silicon. And it also has very high current efficiency up to 14 candela per amps. And very good color gamut of 100% sRGB. So we thought, okay, we have this and whether we can achieve even a higher brightness. And that's the roadmap I'm going to present later. Um, next slide, please. So I begin, why do we need the micro displays for AR and VR applications? Uh, everybody agrees that uh, it is very desirable to have uh, AR, VR systems to be compact, stylish, and very comfortable to wear for a long period of time. Uh, if you start with the direct view large size display, it is not possible to make such compact systems. Yeah. And we all know that uh, today's uh, VR systems are all very bulky and heavy. So compact micro displays with very high pixel density can offer glass-like systems and with a uh, real life-like image. So if you look at the, uh, on the right side, uh, Panasonic uh, introduced their glass-like VR system at TS 2020, uh, incorporating our 2K by 2K OLED micro displays. It is much more stylish and uh, much lighter system. On the right side is the AR system, uh, is a Google Glass, which also incorporates our NHD transmissive LCDs. 
uh, it is one of the uh, most stylish AR product on the market, although it's still not ordinary looking. So uh, AR VR systems will benefit from compact micro displays. Next slide, please. So how, how high brightness do we need from a display for AR and VR applications? I think for VR applications, we need uh, from about 1,000 to 10,000 nits. Because of the uh, enclosed environment, 100 nits to the eye is sufficient. Uh, however, uh, the small micro display needs high magnification to provide large field of view. And ordinary optics cannot provide good enough optics qual uh, image quality. So we need a more special uh, optic design, uh, <clears throat> like the pancake optics you see on the right side. Uh, this pancake optics was designed by 3M and Copian and was incorporated in uh, Panasonic's uh, ES demo. Uh, it provides good image quality and it is also very thin because the optics uh, rays are folded one time. Uh, so it is very thin, uh, less than 20 millimeters. Uh, but the downside is that uh, the optics efficiency is about, only about 10 percent. So 100 nits to the eye now becomes 1,000 nits from the display. And for some applications like gaming that requires fast head motion, uh, low persistence is desired, which means that uh, display should run at low duty cycle uh, typically around 10 percent, then you raise that uh, brightness from display to 10,000 nits. But if you tolerate like 20 percent duty cycle, then 5,000 nits would be sufficient. So our 7,000 nit display already satisfies uh, most of the VR applications. For AR applications, uh, depending on the application and use cases and optics you use uh, in, in this uh, different this, uh, brightness requirements, but typically you would like to have uh, like 20,000 nits or more for see-through optics. Uh, so in the bottom, you see two pilot helmets that also incorporate our uh, transmissible TVs. Uh, they are working in a very high ambient requirement, uh, ambient brightness. Uh, the optics efficiency is uh, less than 10%, and they typically need uh, close to 30,000 nits uh, to get a good image to their eye. On the right side, you have this HoloLens. Uh, it has the wavelength optics, which has even lower efficiency than the uh, uh, our pilot helmets use. Uh, so they need much higher brightness. Um, but if you use different AR optics, see-through optics, like bird bath that was used in Google Glass or Nvidia's uh, glasses, uh, which is probably close to 20% efficiency, uh, you do not need as high brightness. So the AR requirements uh, depend on the use case. Uh, the requirements are different. But 30,000 nits is a very good goal. So we set 30,000 nits our goal. Uh, next slide, please. So why do we choose OLED micro displays? Uh, that's because uh, OLED micro displays have many advantages. It has very high contrast ratio. It is self-emitting, so you do not need a separate illumination source. Uh, so that makes systems more compact. And only the uh, pixels that emit uh, light uh, consume power. So power consumption can be lower. And it has also very high resolution. Uh, for example, we have a 2K, 2K resolution display in 0.99 inch diagonal. 
and also we have a 2.6 K by 2.6 K display and 1.3 inch diagonal. It also uh, allows the uh, integration of many complex uh, functions in the back plane. Uh, our 2.6 by 2.6 K display integrates the MIPI serial interface and also displays stream compression uh, circuits in there. Uh, display also has only a thin cover glass over the image plane, so it is compatible with the uh, very compact optics. And there are uh, mass production facility around the world. Uh, Sony has been producing millions of um, uh, micro OLED displays for camera electronic viewfinders, and uh, a few Chinese companies have installed uh, significant uh, capacity in the past uh, year or two. So the only shortcoming of all the micro displays is low brightness. So if we can resolve this low brightness issue, all the displays can serve many applications. Next slide, please. So I reviewed the uh, methods of making color or micro displays. There are two methods. Uh, one is using the white OLED emitter plus color filters. And the other one is direct patterning of red, green, and blue emitters through uh, shadow mask uh, evaporation. Uh, currently, all the OLED micro displays are made uh, with the white OLED plus color filters. Uh, one problem with these color filters is that uh, it absorbs light. So the color brightness can be one quarter or less. So that's the main downside. But color filters can be patterned by photolithography. So small pixels can be readily made. Uh, the brightness from these uh, color displays is typically less than 1,000 nits. The highest reported brightness uh, using white OLED plus color filter method was 5,000 nits. That was uh, helped by using the micro uh, lens array. So this number was reported by Sony. Um, the direct patterning does not need a color filter. So you can have high efficiency than white OLED plus color filter method. And uh, 7,500 this uh, has been reported. Uh, all cell phone displays, are OLED displays are made this way. But for micro displays, uh, there is a significant challenge for manufacturing because the pixel size is so small, you need to have a very fine shadow mask, which should be fairly accurately aligned. So uh, there is a significant uh, challenge remains. So we decided to choose this white OLED plus color filter method and try to improve the efficiency of white OLED. Uh, currently, all the white OLED uh, in, that are manufactured using the uh, uh, single stack OLED. Uh, next slide, please. So single stack OLED, as you see on the uh, right top, is that it has a one PN junction. The blue emitter and red, green, or orange emitters are placed uh, pretty much in one place. So when hole and electron pairs recombine, it generates photons. Uh, currently, the blue emitter has low efficiency uh, because of the lifetime issue on the other uh, methods. Uh, the red, green emitter material, OLED materials have high efficiency, although you also have a low efficiency 
uh, material. So when you combine these into a, a single stack OLED, and you would like to uh, generate the cool white spectrum that is needed for displays. So to have the uh, a cool white, uh, and if you have an imbalance in efficiency of blue and the red green emitters, uh, you have to sacrifice the efficiency of red and green. Uh, so for warm white, you can have a higher efficiency, but cool white, you have a low efficiency. So uh, typically, the uh, single stack white OLED has current efficiency around six candles per hand. So this is one of the reasons why the current OLED uh, micro displays have low efficiency. Next slide, please. So we are looking to how to improve it and uh, uh, use the double stack uh, approach. In the double stack, dual stack, uh, you have two diodes in series. So those are connected by the charge generation layer, which serves as the tunnel junction and thus provide very low <clears throat> resistance connection. Uh, blue emitter and red green emitters now in the separate positions in two separate junctions. And they can be placed in a, a optimum position uh, for the cavity residence. So when the whole, whole electron pairs are injected, uh, you generate photons twice, first in the top and, the, and then <clears throat> second time in the bottom junction. So by that alone, you have the twice the current efficiency. However, you also take advantage of the uh, have the resonance much more efficiently in the stack. So the net effect is that you have uh, much higher current efficiency, uh, probably more than five times the single stack efficiency. Uh, the penalty of dual stack is the voltage is twice, uh, but in real uh, silicon backplane, the net effect, effect can be smaller than 2x. So the benefit is that uh, uh, the dual stack white OLED can provide much higher brightness at the same current, uh, and a low power consumption or longer lifetime uh, for the same brightness. So this is the uh, <clears throat> much better uh, scenario than single stack case. Next slide, please. One problem for the dual stack OLED is the color mixing. Uh, if you look at the uh, bottom schematic, the anode uh, for each color is separate. On the other hand, the cathode is a common or continuous uh, layer. So uh, if you say uh, turn on the red subpixel, uh, ideally the current should flow just vertically, but because of the very more subpixel size, uh, some part of the current is flowing to the next subpixel. So it is an inherent uh, current crowding or uh, some mixing going on, uh, but it is very manageable in the single stack case. But in dual stack, the problem is much more serious. Uh, the reasons are that uh, dual stack is twice as thicker and there is a highly conductive charge generation layer and the applied voltage is also higher. But as a result, when you have a uh, dual stack and make the color display, you have significant color mixing. For example, if you uh, turn on red pixel, it doesn't look like red, it maybe look like, like pink or some other color. So, uh, by this, the display cannot be used unless you do some other tricks. So please go to the next slide. 
So uh, Copin introduced the our Colormax technology in the silicon backplane. Uh, the anode and our, including our Colormax technology is all prepared at the silicon foundry. So all at deposition doesn't have to worry about depositing a separate whole anode layer. But our Colormax technology uh, suppress the uh, current spreading and the color mixing significantly. So the, we have a very high color fidelity. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows the color spectrum in the color chart. And is that compared with the uh, sRGB triangle? So we match uh, pretty well with the red. Uh, we exceed the uh, 720p in the green. And in the blue is a little uh, long wavelength. But the uh, area of the uh, triangle is almost uh, is 100% sRGB. And when you look at the image of the, uh, the 720 display, it shows very vivid color. Go to the next slide, please. So I showed this curve before, and we have achieved 7,000 units uh, of brightness with the up to 14 candela pen per amp of current efficiency. The contrast ratio at 7,000 nits is more than 4,000. Uh, the contrast ratio at 5,000 nits is more than 100,000 to one. The power consumption, including the all the back plane, is about 500 milliwatts at 7,000 nit full white. That means it's the worst case uh, power consumption. And if you use the video, then power consumption at uh, 7,000 it will be much less. Uh, the ID characteristic on the right side shows excellent characteristics. Uh, it has very low leakage current uh, below threshold, and uh, it has very well behaved curve. Uh, and this ID characteristics was measured through the uh, uh, silicon body diode in series. So the actual voltage is somewhat less at higher current levels. Actually, uh, the 720p display characteristics was measured uh, with the 10 volt overall, 5 volt in VDD uh, silicon circuit and minus 5 volt at the uh, cathode connection. And we assumed uh, that there is about 1.5 volt voltage drop in the silicon pass transistor. So the voltage across the OLED diode itself, we assume is we estimate about 8.5 volt only. Go to the next slide, please. So this shows the comparison of the, some of the measured current efficiencies. Uh, the <clears throat> typical single stack with wide OLED with color filter is about 1.5 candle per annum. Uh, the best uh, single stack with white OLED uh, efficiency was reported by Sony. That was with the micro lens, and that was up to 6.5 candle per hand. So if we re exclude the micro lens effect, uh, the current efficiency of OLED itself may be around 3.5. And our dual stack with white with color filter is 14. Uh, the direct patterning single stack OLED uh, is my uh, estimate. I don't see the reported current efficiency number. Uh, I think it's probably around 10 candle per hand. So the dual stack white with color filter, even with the low efficiency of color filters, has a better current efficiency than the uh, direct pattern uh, single stack OLED. Next slide, please. So with that uh, excellent research, how can we go to 30,000 nits? So we believe that we can increase the brightness of 5x by adding three things. Uh, first is microlens, which we think 
uh, increase up to three times. Uh, instead of a dual stack, we can use trial stack. Uh, in the trial stack, you can increase the uh, current efficiency by 50%. Uh, if you see the trial stack schematic on the right side, uh, you have two charge generation layers to connect each uh, diode. And you have uh, three emitting layers. And in this example, you have two blue emitters and one red green emitter, but you can have a, a different combinations too. Um, MicroLens, uh, I talk more about in the next slide. Uh, it increased the bright, the, the efficiency uh, by increasing the outcoupling efficiency. And also uh, with more collimation, you have a more brightness at the center. Uh, the third is a thinner color filter. Uh, the spectrum of white spectrum in dual stack is, has fairly distinct RGB peaks. So even if you reduce the color filter thickness, we expect it will have decent color fidelity. And for AR applications, uh, some other less color fidelity will be acceptable. Uh, next slide, please. So this shows the two different ways to uh, implement micro lens arrays on the OLED display. The first on the, on the left side is a hybrid approach. Uh, in this case, the micro lens is fabricated on the color filter on cover glass, and then it is aligned and attached with the glue on the OLED uh, display. So it was demonstrated by Sony and they reported 1.8 times efficiency increase. Uh, on the right side is a monolithic approach, uh, which you make the, the micro lens uh, as part of color filter processing, uh, it's similar to CMOS sensor processing. And uh, we think that uh, the efficiency increase up to three times is possible. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, we think that uh, 30,000 nits from OLED micro display is possible. Uh, and the, the, the math is that 7,000 nits, which already achieved, 1.5x from trial stack, 2.5 times the micro lens, and 1.2 times from thinner color filter. So that brings to over 30,000 nits. Um, we still maintain the same current density as our 7,000 nits dual stack. Um, so it's not driving the, the current much higher. And uh, many applications, including VR, doesn't, uh, don't need the, uh, this high 30,000 nits. Um, but uh, if we can achieve very high brightness, a uh, low brightness requirement can be easily uh, satisfied and with the high reliability and uh, less power consumption. So I think that uh, these OLED micro displays can play very important roles in AR VR applications. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Chris, you are mute. Sorry. Thank you. I just want, I, I didn't mean to put myself on mute. I wanted to put on my video, but <laughs> I guess that worked. Uh, so thank you, Han. Um, and I wanted to uh, bring in uh, Carl Gutag, uh, who's Chief Scientific Officer at, uh, at Brea, and uh, also a well-known uh, blogger for, on the industry. Uh, as well as Barry Young, uh, also very well known in the industry uh, and the CEO of the OLED Association. If you guys can turn on your cameras and microphones right now, we will try and
Mm. Io ti lo dentro. What? That's weird. I don't know why it keeps muting me. Uh, but thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Carl and Barry, are you on the line? Yes. I okay. am. Excellent. So let me uh, actually turn it over to each of you uh, to uh, ask some questions of Hong, uh, specifically related to uh, the presentation he just gave. If you have some specific questions, have at it. Barry, you want to start? Oh, sure. So Hong, um, when you compared uh, direct patterning with your own process uh, in terms of Candela's param, did that include the use of a micro lens for direct patterning, or did it uh, not include it? For our 14 candidate per M does not include micro lens, and uh, the direct patterning doesn't include the micro lens. So it's an apple to apple comparison. Um, so in um, when you get to uh, uh, the three stack, approach can you estimate uh the um the milliwatts to deliver 100 or 150 uh, lumens to the eye the i think the uh, lumens per watt uh for our uh, 7000 net dual stack is uh maybe uh, six to seven Lumen per watt, depending on whether you count on the silicon pass transistor power or not. Um, for trial stack, we are maintaining the same current density, uh, increased efficiency 50%, increased voltage 50%. So net effect of the power efficiency would be the same. So Maybe I understood. The power efficiency remains the same, yes. even though you have a dual stack or a tri stack. In the first order, yes, because we are increasing the current efficiency by 50%. At the same time, the applied voltage increased by 50%. Okay. So, so to deliver a hundred lumens to the eye when you start with 30,000 nits how many what's the power consumption um 30,000 nits uh, i think it's about the same because all we did in getting to 30,000 nits is improving the efficiency um so by micro lens, we are not adding more power to it. We just concentrate the power into a smaller collimation angle. And color filter, you increase the transmission through color filters. Mm -hmm. So increasing the efficiency. So 100 nits to the eye, uh, 30,000 nits. Uh, so it's lumen per watt would be similar. So six to so seven lumen per watt. So the, um, when you uh, showed the uh, information, uh, the specs on uh, on the red, green, um, emitter, uh, uh, dopants rather, was that assuming it was phosphorescent or fluorescent? Um, so I assume uh, phosphorescent, uh, red, green. Uh, and fluorescent blue. So as I explained, there is a mismatch in the efficiencies. So you have to sacrifice the efficiency of more efficient red and green materials to make the core white. So you are not getting as high efficiency that you can get from uh, <clears throat> high efficiency red green material. On the other hand, Sony seems to have high efficiency, so they may have played some more tricks to get high efficiency. So what would be the impact uh, if you had a high efficiency green, I mean a high efficiency blue? 
think that will improve overall. We can improve the single stack, but uh, dual stack also would improve the efficiency. Um, so if you had a, uh, a blue that produced the same uh, candelas per lumen as, uh, as red, how much improvement how much reduction in power or how much improvement in lumens per watt would you get? Yeah, I haven't done much thought about it, but I think uh, probably 30 to 50%, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, in the next two years we'll have it. So uh, I've already seen it. So I think that's a, a good possibility to improve the performance. Yeah, um, we can take advantage of better material all the time. Sure. Yeah, Chris, we, I think that's about my, those are my questions. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, kind of a follow-up here. You said you have about six to seven lumens per watt. Is that for white? Is that for a white? No, uh, that's the colors. We have a 7,000 nits coming out. We calculated the, uh, the power consumption of uh, <clears throat> our 720p display and calculate how many lumens and how much power in there. Yeah, so that's, uh, those are what I'll call white lumens. In other words, that's not a single color. That's a, that's a white lumen. Yes, it's white, yes. Okay. All right, that sounds reasonable. Um, the, um, I guess my, my, my kind of kind of shift the focus a little bit is a question about the optics this will go into because, you know, even if you're talking, you know, seven to 10 to, to go into 30,000 nits, you're not going to be going into something like a waveguide. Uh, you know, diffractive waveguides efficiencies are horrible, and particularly in coupling things uh, that are, even though you put a micro lens on it, you're still fairly Lambertian. So um, I guess the question is, have you thought about what kind of optics you would put this into? Yeah, for AR applications, uh, we provided optics and display modules or non see through type applications. But we have not focused on providing optic solution for see through optics. So uh, that's up to our customers to uh, <clears throat> integrate into. Uh, for waveguide optics, yeah, it favors the more normal instance and a smaller collimation angle is preferred. So when you have very high brightness, very narrow collimated beam and spread out into large eye box. The efficiency will be very low. So if you count from nits to nits, it will be horrible. But if you count uh, number of photons going, coming in and number of photons coming out, it may not be as bad. Yeah, but I mean, even the micro LEDs are finding that, that it's problematic working with waveguides and they're talking million nits. So you, you can put a million nits in and you might get a hundred nits out of a, a micro LED. Uh, whereas, uh, so, but there are other optics, um, uh, uh, freeform optics and other things people are looking at to use with things like OLEDs. We know twos, for example, they've got a micro OLED connected to a, um, to their optics and all, which is a form of free form. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious what you're thinking about, because um, it's a, AR is a tough problem uh, when it comes to doing this. However, when you start talking more than a few hundreds of nits, then as your first slide showed, it seemed to throw, say that you're out of the realm of VR, that VR doesn't need, does VR need, well, it's probably a good question, do you think the VR needs 30,000 nits coming out of an OLED? I don't think so. Yes. So I said maybe up to 10,000 nits. Even that one can be reduced depending on the uh, duty cycle requirements. Yeah, so my thing here is there's a gap that VR needs in the, to the eye hundreds of nits, whereas in AR, they're the ones who are needing these really bright displays because they lose so much in the optical combining is going to lose easily 10x, and in some cases, 100x or more of the nits in to nits out. So, yeah, yeah. okay. 
yeah, that, that's why I'm kind of wor or interested where 30,000 kind of straddles that line where it's way too bright for VR and only bright enough for certain AR optical architectures. Yes. Um, so as I said, our customers for power helmets, their numbers are about 30,000 nets. So that's one benchmark. Uh, depending on the optics you choose, the brightness requirements for AR can vary uh, fairly significantly. So <clears throat> I don't think there is uh, just one display that can satisfy all the applications. So uh, if you can satisfy maybe 70%, 50% of applications, I think that's already pretty good. I, actually, I wanted to return to the uh, to your OLED uh, stack, if I could, Hong. Um, so you sh in the in the trio stack, you showed two blue layers. Um, it seems to me that would increase uh, efficiency of the blue, so you wouldn't have to drive the the red green part as hard. Yeah, that's the um, because the OLED uh, blue material efficiency is only one quarter of the red and green. So if, as uh, Barry said, if more efficient blue material is available, then you can have a separate RGB stacks and have an even higher brightness. But doesn't, doesn't two blue layers increase efficiency by definition? Yes, it, it does. Okay. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your uh, your color max technology. Um, you haven't said much about what it does. Can you say a little bit more about how it works? Yeah, I said to explain the um, the main reason for color mixing is current spread. Right. So we have uh, some structure in our anode to prevent uh, this current spreading. That's all you can say. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me ask you about the micro lens array as, as well. Um, uh, is that a, a concept at this point? Have you done some uh, any prototypes? Uh, we haven't made prototypes, but we have uh, some survey of the materials availability, and uh, you know, I think it's feasible. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I have one more question, if that's sure. okay. Please. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about the duty cycle? You talked about a lower duty cycle. How, how do we think about that? Yeah, I think that the lower duty cycle, especially for uh, VR uh, in gaming applications, uh, they try to reduce persistence. So one way to do that is reduce the duty cycle and uh, that the duty cycle mechanism can be incorporated in the silicon backplane. So you can have a global shutter or a rolling shutter. So you can combine either methods to achieve a low duty cycle. So you need the uh, much higher peak brightness, um, but uh, the average power consumption will be not as high. Uh, if you have a 10% duty cycle, you have to increase the peak brightness 10x, but uh, every power consumption would be the same. Thank you. Ong, um, have, you, um, have you done some estimates on the cost for adding, uh, for a duo stack and a trio stack compared to a single stack in terms of maybe yeah. percentage, the delta? Duo stack, the growth time is a little longer but uh, if you put it in the uh, uh, system, uh, the material utility, uh, usage is say twice for the OLED stack. Uh, growth time may be increased, but uh, a lot of growth time has other uh, <clears throat> time needed. So overall growth time is not increased that much. So I think the, there is some incremental cost increase uh, once you dialed in your growth recipe, it should not matter. And it is uh, grown in a mass producible machines. 
So there is no upgrading the uh, manufacturing machines. So that's one big benefit of dual stack approach. Okay. So specifically on uh, executing your roadmap now to uh, to 30,000 nits or so, what do you see as the, the major challenges on that roadmap? Yeah, I think the dual stack, the trial stack, once you have a right um, stack design, it's not that big a deal. It should just grow it and then uh, optimize uh, the details. Uh, reducing the color filter is not a big deal. It's very straightforward. Uh, making the micro lens will be more challenging. You need to have a special materials. So finding the right materials and uh, tuning the uh, <clears throat> lens fabrication method will take time. But uh, the lens manufacturing is well known. The method is well known. Uh, CMOS sensor, as I mentioned, is using that same technology. So uh, it will take time and money to do that, but I don't see a big roadblock. OK. And I think you're talking about three years as the timeline to, to achieve that? Yeah, that's our goal. OK. Uh, Barry and, and Carl, you've also seen um, uh, what Imagine has done with their direct patterning. They're, uh, they're on a roadmap also to, some, uh, to reach this level. I'm, I don't think they've talked about a time frame. But uh, what, what's your opinion on you know, the, the color filter approach that, uh, that Copen's uh, using versus direct patterning? Well, um, Imagine uh, is able to, if, if they're able to do direct patterning, that obviously eliminates the color filter. And by eliminating the color filter, you improve the output of, uh, in terms of NITs, by a factor of four. So, um, it seems to me that we're, that it would be uh, quite competitive with what um, what Copen is doing. Um, they have not uh, played with uh, micro lenses, so that's not uh, so we can't uh, identify. We can't uh, figure out whether we have no data yet or whether that works or not with uh, with direct patterning, although it should. Um, and they also talk about multiple stacks to increase the multiple layers of red, green, and blue to increase the uh, performance, but there's no uh, uh, examples of that done yet. So I think it'd be competitive. Um, and uh, in terms of time frame, I think they've been, uh, they have said in their um, quarterly uh, uh, financial reviews that they're looking at 2023. Uh, so okay. I think the time frames are about the same. I think the reason uh, that right now they're working with a, um, as I understand it, they're working with a, a, a prototype equipment and that would have to be, uh, they would have to have a, a mass production equipment to do that. I also noted that uh, OLED works uh, said they were working on a similar similar duo concept, but they had um, they had stacked up to five layers. So uh, they really do didn't say much more than that, but they're working on that. But I would like to ask Kong one more question, which is, have you considered using quantum dots to replace the color filter to improve the efficiency? Yeah, so quantum dots uh, is applicable uh, more with the blue emitters. So if you have a, a white OLED stack and color filter, no, quantum dots for blue or quantum dots for red, then there is other uh, light 
leaking through that. So <clears throat> uh, we haven't considered the, the quantum dot approach to replace uh, color filters. Yeah, I know that the micro LED guys, I think, have given up pretty much on quantum dots because the efficient, they basically need on micro displays. You can see it for like large things like televisions or even maybe cell phones. But for for these really tiny micro displays, the stack of quantum dots you need is just too thick. And so the ability to control it and not have bleed side to side, I'm, that's my understanding from what I've heard from people is that the, the really small pixel, like these three to 10 micron pixel ranges have pretty much given up on quantum dots unless you've heard something. Well, I, 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 I've seen people that are working on lithographically patterning the quantum dots. So um, I don't think it's a finished product yet or anywhere near complete, but there's still a lot of work going on. But is it for, is it for a micro display size pixel? Or is it for something more like a TV or a cell phone? No, TVs are, uh, the way TVs are made, are, they're going to uh, print them with inkjet printing. But you yeah. can't uh, you can't do that with uh, 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 with a uh, cell phone because the pixel density is too high. The inkjet printers can get up to about 200 ppi. Yeah, but what I'm saying with the quantum dots, my understanding is you need what for a huge pixel is a very would not be a thick layer. But what happens is when you scale it down to a, a tiny pixel, the relative yeah. the height the weight. <laughs> The height nice versus the width is just gets ridiculous right. uh, for micro displays, and you can't get enough color converted. You basically need this really thick layer of quantum mm -hmm. dots in order to do the conversion. As I said, I haven't seen any yeah. any uh, data on that other than the entities that are working on it. Yeah. Let me uh, let me just pause here for a second. I want to uh, uh, launch one of these polls here since so we're uh, moving along on time. Uh, bear with me a second. Okay, uh, looks like you should see on your screen now which approach will be the first to achieve around 30,000 nits with around 100% sRG color performance. Uh, the white OLED with color filters approach or the RGB uh, direct pattern approach. Uh, so you can use, uh, you can start to uh, put your answers in on that uh, while I move on to the, the next question I wanted to ask the panel. Um, specifically, uh, there's been some rumors that Sony uh, has uh, is going to be, uh, I'm sorry, that Apple is going to move forward uh, with an, uh, an AR glasses display. I mean, we've heard these rumors for years now, of course, uh, but it seems to be maybe a little bit more substantial now because they're talking specifically about a Sony micro OLED panel. So I just wanted to ask each of you what you what you know and what you think about this development. Hong, maybe you want to start? Yeah, I also saw the, uh, the news about the rumor. Um, so I hope the rumor turns out to be true. Uh, <laughs> Apple has been very good at introducing uh, product at the right time and with the right design and with the you know, marketing power to make a new category happen. So if they introduce the uh, air glasses with the OLED display, it's a really good news for the uh, OLED mic display industry and also AR <clears throat> glass community. So I hope that uh, the rumor is true and uh, we look forward to seeing it. Carl? Um, it's me. Yeah, um, well, I've heard the rumors too. Um, it kind of changes the perspective. You know, they they were, they bought companies like Aconia doing waveguides, diffractive waveguides. But as we discussed earlier, diffractive waveguides aren't going to work with, mic with um, micro OLEDs. They're just not bright enough. Right. So it kind of suggests that they've got, if it's, if it's true, that they've got to have another optic solution. So it's um, and it's unlikely that they would accept something like the Enreal Birdbath. Uh, that we know to work with OLEDs. 
and maybe they're going with something more novel. Um, one of the favorites on my list is that there's a startup in um, Israel called Orim. Oh, um, so that might be a possibility, but you've got to start thinking a little out of the box because the traditional ways of trying to route OLEDs to the eye is is not, you know, the, you, you need something that's very, very efficient compared to like the flat wave guides we've seen with like HoloLens and Magic Leap and so forth. Indeed. Barry? Well, it seemed to me that the specs on what they put out for the Sony micro display wouldn't meet most of the requirements for AR in terms of uh, lumens. So maybe uh, Sony's promising something that they're going to do rather than the one that was uh, spec in all the articles that got presented. What, what spec did you say for lumens or brightness? I think it was uh, 1,000 candelas per meter square. Well, in theory, if you had a a thousand per meter squared yeah yeah I'm like, the, was the, the, was the, one, the, the one that was quoted was uh a oled micro display that produced a thousand candelas per meter square yeah well they have that but that's the display that's not what gets to the eye and no I no i was just talking about the display yeah well they they sell those right so, I mean, that's a routine product for them now. I mean, they've well, got- I understand that, but I didn't think it would meet, uh, it wouldn't produce the, the kind of uh, uh, nits to the eye of 100, 150, it only would produce maybe, uh, I think probably a third of that. Yeah, I think if they went with something that was a more direct solution, yeah, they, they, you maybe have a 10 to 1 divider, and then they've got to get their brightness up a bit. So let's say they can put lenses or something. They might get 3,000 nits out of the display. Then maybe they can get one or 200 to the eye, depending upon what they, uh, or sorry, maybe two to 300 to the eye uh, there, which is still kind of dim for out, you know, you're not going to use that outdoors. But um, anyway, there might be some, I'm trying to think about ways of trying to make it happen, kind of mentally re-engineer it to make it happen. And yeah, three, even 3,000 nits coming out of the panel is tough to get that to the eye unless you're going to block a lot of light. Like you're going to have a 50-50 combiner so you can get half of the light to the eye while you block half of the real world. Yeah, so Sony uh has uh demonstrated 5000 nits with the color filter and micro lens so we do not know whether they made this further progress so we have to see how it really comes out yeah anyway i think it's going to take some novel optics though someplace uh it, it can't be it can't be waveguides or people expanding waveguides it's got to be something that is more direct and the problem with the more direct paths is they tend to have bigger optics. I mean, the reason people go to diffractive waveguides or, or Loomis type uh, reflective people expanding waveguides is that they're trying to keep things small, really tiny. And when you start to go bigger, you start to have to have big, bigger optical elements everywhere. Do you think they would be considering a a, a non see through designs so that they would have cameras in a in a more VR like environment? Not not if they're doing AR. <laughs> I would I, I can't see that happening uh, with for a Apple type AR product. I could see that for some industrial applications and some various applications such as we've seen with um, uh, the Varjo. You know where they do the thing with the with the headset, yeah. But I can't see Apple doing that as a product that's going to mass market. I think it's got more. That's more of an industrial dedicated use type thing. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Uh, let's see. Um, let me interrupt here, and I'll give you the results of this poll here. I'm not sure if that's visible on the screen or not, but 
the response was 43% think white OLED with the color filters will be the winner in, in a few years versus 57% for the RGB direct patterning. And since we are at the well, already at the top of the hour, um, I'm going to move to some of the audience questions here. I do have some more panel questions, but let's move to some audience questions so we can uh, get a few of these in as well. So let me uh, bear with me while I read through some of these a little bit. I think we've addressed many of these questions already. Uh, yeah, so one question about the duo stack and the, and the tri stack. Um, uh, the duo stack does increase the, uh, the drive voltage. Um, so the, the question is about um, the implications of that. Um, uh, and, and also going to a, a, a three-stack design. Does that have an impact on the backplane design and the drive circuitry, Tom? Huh? Yeah, so our dual stack uh, is no problem with our current backplane. Uh, we believe the, it can still support the drive stack because most of the uh, extra voltage is applied across the OLED diode is not affecting the silicon circuit as much. Okay, so but you do need, I think you said plus or minus uh, five volts on the back plane, right? Yes, uh, but you can apply more negative uh, voltage to the cap. So it's a more DC voltage, and the, all the uh, signal uh, voltage is still in the digital and analog voltage remains the same. Okay. So you wouldn't have to change the design role or the foundry uh, processes necessarily to go to a, a, a tri-stack then? And that's our thoughts right now. Okay. Uh, is 7,000 uh, nits commercially available now is the question from Copen. Um, not yet, but uh, I think we hoped to introduce uh, in the near future, but I cannot promise the timing. Okay. Uh, how about, about 10,000 nits? Um, 10,000 nits. We have to develop more things for 10,000 nits. So for 7,000 nits, uh, our current backplane without doing anything else, uh, we already achieved that. So we have to refine and uh, uh, go through the yield and other <clears throat> engineering work. But 10,000 nits needs some development. Okay. Uh, there's been a few questions about laser-based scanning as well. Um, maybe I'll just uh, ask you guys, well, maybe maybe not Hong, but Barry and Carl, what do you think about laser-based scanning as a competitive solution? Yeah, well, those who read my blog will probably know I, I don't have the highest of opinions of laser beam scanning. Um, the effect of resolution is always grossly overstated, usually by at least 2x in each dimension. So I have I have a lot of issues with it. I my blog I've I've detailed that a lot on Hololens too. Um, um, the brightness, I mean, the contrast is another thing that gets brought up. Of course, OLEDs and micro LEDs have extremely good contrast as well. Contrast is usually limited by the optics. If you look at the optical combination, it, it's there. Plus, we've seen, like, my, I mean, Microsoft has spent who knows how many hundreds of millions of dollars to bring that to market um, uh, compared to anybody else. I mean, they spent a lot of money on it. And the image quality is really pretty poor and apparently very sensitive. My other understanding I hear is that they have a lot of yield problems, that the precision to build to get the waveguide in there. And if you actually look at the waveguide engine of the engine that's in the HoloLens 2, it's big. I mean, and once again, I've documented that on my blog. So, I mean, OLEDs do get you into a really small form factor because you, you save on the optics. The other thing that's kind of interesting out there is laser illuminated LCOS. Uh, Digilens has got some stuff going on now. I just uh, 
uh, talk to them a bit. And they've got some interesting, I don't know whether it'll work out, but they've got some interesting ways of uh, illuminating L cost. It gets rid of the beam splitter, which is a major optical problem. If you have a cube in there and then follow that with optics, it, it turns out if you're working distance, the optics get bad. So there's also a laser illuminated L cost. It's something to at least think about in the future. I don't know if it's going to work out, but but DigiLens is has, is doing some interesting developments there. But yeah, I just um, the problem I have with laser scanning is is that you either go and by the way, laser scanning is two different things. You've got the direct to the eye, i.e. the north focals thing where you get no eye box. And then you have the way where you've got to do some kind of gross pupil expander uh, where you kind of effectively turn it into an ordinary display where it's just laser scanning and then you've got to relay that up to the eye. And so you kind of got to break it into those two. I always kind of break it into two categories. We're talking a holographic mirror that you kind of bend it into the eye and, and write directly, or are we talking one where it's going to have a decent eye box? Uh, there is some new stuff. I'm trying to think who did it. I just saw some stuff on um, guys are trying to come up with a way to do laser scanning that is uh, that has a good eye box, but I haven't gotten they I've seen some stuff, but they haven't gotten back to me on how it's actually going to work. I'm always a little skeptical until they they tie it all down and I can actually see one. Okay. Barry, any comments? No, I don't know much about it. Okay, fair enough. Let me put up uh, another poll here before we uh, we close this out here. Uh, it says, well, oh, I can't even read it myself. It says. Uh, for AR applications, how will eyeglasses-based solutions compare to the smartphone style? Uh, eyeglass solutions will, and you've got some choices here. Uh, let me go back to the questions while people are looking through this. Uh, we haven't talked too much about um, uh, micro -LED. Well, we talked a little bit about micro-LEDs and their, their uh, competition here. I think most people would say it's it's uh, an ideal, potentially an ideal solution, but still uh, a lot to be proven. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, well, I, I tend to, I've been following micro LEDs for about three or four years now. And, um, you know, they have their, um, they're very promising, you know, they're talking millions of nits and their efficiency, I think is about 10 X that of OLEDs, give or take. And it depends upon how you measure things. Um, as you get into white, you know, everybody's playing games with numbers, but um, they're, they're, they're obviously delivering. I mean, you can buy samples now. Their big problem is how are they going to do color? Uh, are you going to combine it? You know, we've seen some novel ways where you do waveguides to combine them. Uh, you don't necessarily want to put the color cube. A lot of them are showing the color cube or the X cube. The problem with the X cube, you're back to that back focal distance where you've now got this cube in the way of the display. So there's just a lot of interest. There are things going on there, and it's kind of a hot new topic. But I think a little bit of the uh, they're getting past the wild enthusiasm stage where they talk millions of nits and everyone goes crazy. And now you're coming down to saying, well, how are you going to get to do color? How are you going to make it manufacturable? How are you going to make the cost? Uh, if you want to do single color, it's starting to become a reality. One other little thing though is gets back to image quality too because most of them don't have very good control on a pixel by pixel basis of the color of each pixel. There's a lot of variability from pixel to pixel in the brightness. You kind of get this kind of noisy pattern kind of uh, stippled through the whole thing. It's like it's on a, a very noisy background. So um, there's all those things there. I, it just feels to me like I've been watching for three or four years and it looks like it's going to take a while before they get there. Yeah, so I agree that uh, it will take some more engineering development and manufacturing improvements for color or the LED displays to be successful. Um, so regarding the efficiency comparison, um, the LED displays do not have a higher efficiency than OLED displays for current. I compare them and uh, uh, they're about the same for single stack OLED. 
But the major advantages of the LED displays in terms of getting higher brightness is that they can go to much higher current density. If you talk about this uh, 2 million nits uh, from Jade Bird, uh, it is at 70 M per square centimeter. And uh, all the displays are in the uh, tens of milliamp per square centimeter. It's a three orders of magnitude different. So that's uh, one reason. Another reason is that the uh, solid state LEDs have much lower voltage per very high current density. So this pretty much stay close to three volts while all the displays, as you drive higher current density, the voltage increases more rapidly. So those are the two main reasons why the LED displays can go to much higher brightness. On the other hand, the manufacturing process is more complicated and uh, the, <laughs> the current status of a manufacturing is not quite there yet. And the color conversion is still pretty, still premature. So it will take some more time, but once all those issues are resolved, LED display can be you know, very promising. Yeah, um, one thing I would point out is that they do benefit more from micro lenses and OLEDs because the emit area of the micro LEDs is pretty tiny. And and I think they they're going to gain they're going to gain more what I call collimation gain out of being able to take from a small light source. The micro lenses should help them a bit more than OLEDs, but the color they're way behind, um, and uniformity and a lot of other things are way behind. Yes, I have a, a couple of comments about it. Um, right now. Uh, the only practical solution is to use a single color, and more than likely some sort of blue and some color change. That if you use the color filter and blue, or you convert blue to white and then use a color filter, I think it's no more efficient than uh, than an, an OLED, at least from the numbers that I've seen. Uh, so, and. Uh, if you use uh, uh, LEDs, um, then you're going to need some form of redundancy because uh, some of the LEDs over time are going to uh, catastrophically fail. Uh, some reports have said as much as uh, one or two percent per year. So when you start talking about a hundred million or a uh, hundred million. Um, Subpixels, uh, that's a lot of failures. So I would expect that you're going to have some redundancy requirements, which are going to make the the uh, size a little bit larger than uh, uh, than maybe even OLEDs. Uh, on the other hand, there is a little bit of work or quite a bit of work going on to do a uh, RGB on a single uh, wafer. And that requires uh, some very, very small uh, subpixels to, to, or a number of uh, maybe nano rods or uh, nano wires uh, to make up a single pixel. So uh, that work is going on. Uh, the best I can uh, for the companies that are working on it, they. Uh, they're anticipating year, uh, time frames like 2023, so that's probably pretty optimistic. But if you could, if you could do something like that, and it takes, and you can do multiple nano wires or nano rods uh, that make up a single subpixel, you don't have a redundancy issue, uh, and they still can use gallium nitride because of the small size and the ability to efficiently use gallium nitride for red and green. Uh, seems to me that would be a competitive uh, um, to that would be a the solution for micro uh, for micro displays. Whether that will be better than OLEDs or not, or less costly, probably not. But they will yeah. deliver. Uh, uh, higher performance in terms of power consumption. 
Yeah, I don't know anybody who's anymore, like three years ago they were talking about it, but I don't know anybody anymore who's going to do color convert, talking color conversion with micro display, micro LEDs, as I said, on the tiny ones. I do want to mention, I forgot to mention Ostendo. Ostendo is actually showing, and I've seen color, full color micro, OLED, micro LEDs where they do it in layers. They have a red, green, and blue layer. And that has kind of an advantage optically too, because it's coming from a smaller point, but they are also quite a bit reduced in their brightness. They're talking, they will get to, they expect to get to the hundreds of thousands of nits, not the millions of nits like the single color guys. But yeah, that's the, so they're, they're in kind of this quasi category and they are, they have made them. Now the question is, can they make a manufacturable, you know, will there be a lifetime issue? I don't know. LEDs are, have a reputation for being very durable, but when you build really tiny LEDs, the question then becomes, will they be durable? Do you have a manufacturable process? Um, yeah, color's a big challenge, but the bottom line is, I think yeah, anything, anybody saying they're going to be there in three years in production is being grossly optimistic, other than we do know that Jaybird is, you know, they're going to production with a low resolution one, single color. And, um, you know, they can do that, but it's single color. Now you got to come up with a way to combine it. Do you take like a waveguide? Like one of the approaches out there is you take three waveguides side by side. You basically take three waveguides, each working on a very different color. You inject into each of those. And then you the, the waveguides themselves are doing the combining. And that's like Busick has shown a video that implies that. I've seen patents from Facebook that, that talk about doing this. Uh, so, and, and it can be done. It's obviously will work to take three individual LED, uh, micro LEDs and put them in a waveguide. It's still a question of what's that's going to cost. You're going to buy three chips and, and putting that all together and all. Uh, you got three sets. That would be a pretty big thing because their 0.3 display is only our, our um, VGA. So getting to something like 2,000 by 2,000, it's going to increase the size, and then you put three together. Yeah. That'd be a, that'd be a, a, a top sell. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's other people out there. There's guys like, you know, you're looking at like 1080p.26 from Compound Photonics. Um, so there, there are guys out there trying stuff, but I don't think any of this stuff is as nearly as far along as OLEDs are. I mean, it's it, we're talking, I think 20, 2023 for a full color micro LED is, is woefully optimistic. Uh, other than, or you're going three chips. So now you got to buy three of these OLED chips and you got to put a, or micro LED chips and you got to put them side by side, but now you're buying three chips plus the optics for each, all three of them and all that. I and agree with you. But there. If you look at a company like uh, NS Nano, Nanotech, they've been working on this for 10 years. So they have some uh, some optimism that they've made some real breakthroughs on it. Okay, uh, I, we, we could talk about micro LEDs all day long, which we can't do. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, <laughs> let me just finish <laughs> off the, the poll here, first of all. <laughs> um, the results of the poll are 5% um, say uh, eyeglasses display have a very small market share. 42%, which is the majority, say it has a modest, a moderate market share. Uh, and then uh, the next highest one is 26% with a dominant market share. So a pretty broad range of opinions on this. In it's other words, of, nobody knows. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we are running well past the hour here, and I do have to wrap this up. Um, let me ask maybe one more question. Um, there was a recent article uh, uh, that uh, Stanford University and Samsung uh, Institute, um, uh, their research institute, published an article on a 10,000 PPI um, uh, micro OLED display, uh, with this, which uses meta mirrors uh, to help uh, increase that. I guess it was the contrast and the color and and, and all that. Do you, I I think you probably looked at that, but uh, do you have any comments? It seems a little researchy, but any comments? 
Yeah, well, I don't have a lot other than a trend. I always like to translate things back to microns <laughs> when I'm talking about something like that. It works out to about a two and a half micron pixel. I don't know, was that a full color one or not? And yes, it was white. It was it's a white, but they are claiming you, they can create RGB by tuning those meta mirrors, basically for resonance when they, with those uh, each of those colors. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Like I say, I don't really understand it where it gets there, but I, it sounds very researchy to me. It's one of those things that, you know, we might might see something happen in ten years and we might not hear of it again. Yes. No, I look into it a little bit. And it looks like that they have uh, nano pillars uh, arranged such that it has uh, different reflectivity for different color. So you can tune the red pixel with your higher red reflectivity or blue with higher blue reflectivity. And they can be patterned in a submicron nan nanoscale pillars. So in principle, they can be done in the silicon fab with very advanced uh, lithography, and uh, it can boost efficiency. So from that regard, uh, it is good. Uh, it can be practical if the silicon fab can do that. Uh, 10,000 uh, PPI, uh, I mean, that's just the, uh, all inside, but you have to support that with the uh, backplane, and that would be much tougher to do. Yeah, like I say, you're looking at two and a half microns, and so remember, wavelength of light is only nominally about five, uh, uh, you know, 0.5 microns. So you're only like five wavelengths of light at that point. So it, it's interesting to see how they do it and how they'll get color done. And it says if you do full color, does that mean you need three of these? And so now you're talking a pixel size, it's three times that size, and then do you need separation and all? There's a lot of things where it's just kind of basic research and it's kind of hard to see how it's all gonna translate up when you try to actually do something with it. Barry, the last word is yours. Well, I just, uh... I didn't spend much time on it because it's very researchy, and I don't real I don't really understand why you need ten thousand PPI. It's not going to if the screen door effect is already solved. Then what's what what values does it bring? But you know I could be missing something. Okay. All right, gentlemen, uh, we have to close it out now. I want to thank you very much uh, for your participation. I want to thank you, the audience, for, for your excellent questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, but um, we'll try and continue this conversation and perhaps in other venues. Thank you very much, and have a good day, all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. <laughs>